and welcome to Life on Lisbonard Street. I'm Rebecca Jones and I'm delighted to be here with the cast and company of A Little Life. I first read the novel back in 2015 when it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and as part of my role as the BBC's arts correspondent I interviewed all the authors shortlisted for the prize including Hanya Yana Gihara, who is here with us. And uh, I remember, I don't know if you remember, Hanya, but I did ask you if you felt that the book could be a film. And you said you didn't think it could exist as a film, but that you did think it might be able to exist as a TV miniseries. But who knew it would exist as a play first? Uh, enough from me. What I want to do now is get everybody here to just introduce themselves. So, Hanya, let's kick off with you. Hanya Yanagihara, and I'm the author of the original text. James. Uh, James, uh, and I'm playing Jude St. Francis. I'm Luke, and I'm playing Willem. This is like drama school. I'm, I'm Zubin. <laughs> I'm Zubin, and I'm playing Harold. I'm Emilio, and I play Andy, who's Jude's doctor. I'm Zach, and I'm playing Malcolm. I'm Amari, and I'm playing JB. Um, Elliot, and I'm playing all the bad men in Jude's life. Three of them. Three of them. I'm Natalie and I'm playing Anna. Brilliant. Well, look, what we're here to do today is we're here to celebrate the anniversary of the original publication, discuss the book and hear about the preparations of bringing it to the stage and asking all the questions that we have received from fans from around the world. So thank you for those. So let's get cracking. And James, I'm going to start with you, but uh, others will have thoughts, I'm sure. Um, this book touched the lives of so many people. So many people love this book. I wonder how much pressure, therefore, you feel in bringing it to the stage. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful privilege to be a part of this production and, and the reason is, is because of the number of people who have as you say loved this book and been so affected by it um uh, it has sort of um, a double effect one of course it's terrifying because there is a lot of expectation and people have very clear um versions of these characters and the world and they went through something i mean and everyone goes through something when they read the book whether they throw it across the room in in fury and disgust or mostly they cherish it and it moves them and changes them forever and we're not trying to replicate it for everyone of course it was well, it's our imprint it's evo's vision it's hanya's vision um and a kind of mix and wonderful um mel melting of those two but um we also do want to try and protect the essence of your extraordinary piece of work and so there is a, a huge responsibility there and so yeah that is pressure but it's the best type of pressure yeah has anybody else had a reaction when they've said oh i'm about to appear in a little life yeah, I think, yeah, yeah it's, it, I, I remember when I, um, yeah, because the book, book came out in 2015 and there was a time where I was just getting on the tube and it was just, you would see it everywhere. So it definitely feels like just part of our sort of cultural makeup of like, obviously it's, it's set in New York, but just feels like it, it, it just sort of bled into the, in, into the city, you just see it everywhere. So mm. yeah, I think for anyone who's sort of said to anyone, Everyone knows it, even if they've not read the novel. So, yeah. Pressure. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd also say I think you can feel like you're a couple of steps ahead than you would be if no one really knew about it. Like, I think any play when it first opens or, you know, the first moments of play, you know, you can feel a sort of sense of, OK, so no one knows anything about this clean slate. OK, slowly try and layer it. But here, instead, you've got this bed of, like, feeling and people, are, you know, some people come to it full. And that's amazing. Like, yeah, as an actor, like, I feel like you get to lean, you want something like that to lean back on to sort of like, mm. to sort of bore you into that world. And so actually it's, it's, it, it's also, it, it's double-edged, as you said. Like, I think it's pressure, but it's also a, a gift because you just get to float on top of that rather than have to like, I don't know what this is. Do the heavy, dig yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> James, you mentioned Evo. That's, of course, Evo Van Hove, who has directed and is adapting your book, Kanye. And I, I did wonder, though, how involved you've been in the whole process. Technically, not at all. You know, it's Evo's um, adaptation. It's his vision, and it's the cast. And it really does belong to them, as I told them each individually when I got the chance to meet with them before rehearsals began. 
And the reason I gave him the rights back in 2017, this is when the Dutch version came out, is because you know I, I knew his work and I admired it, and I knew he would have ideas. And there is, we are kind of in, in this moment in, in Hollywood where books, by the way, are no longer called books, they're called IP, intellectual property, mm -hmm. and people just buy them and keep them, and they don't really have a plan for them. But I think if anyone knows Ivo's work, you can look back at his other plays and see that he does something strange and revelatory and really singular with everything he buys So and, 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 and adapts. So I, I have been lucky enough to, to observe, and I rewrote parts of the script um, to make it feel a little more American, and I nativized the English, but it really does belong to him and to these people who, um, just by dint of who they are and their personalities and how they interpret these roles, are going to make it into something different altogether. And shall we have it on record that you're, you're pretty happy with the casting? <laughs> I hate all of them. <laughs> I cry every night. No, no, no. I, 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 I did have a say in it, and um, and I'm I'm so honored. I mean, each one of these actors is so extraordinary on their own, and together, just watching them build intimacy with each other, watching them have chemistry with one another, um, it, it's getting to watch that in real time. How how they figure out how they're going to convey a closeness of relationships or or a menace in Elliot's case has been really thrilling. You know, you just watch what they do and it is, it's really magical, it's, it's like alchemy. Talking about watching what you do, I mean, can, can you tell us a little bit about the rehearsal process? At the moment, it feels quite relaxed to me, which I'm surprised by to a certain degree because of the content. Yeah. But it's relaxed, I think, in a good way in that we're finding each other, as Hanya said, we're developing those relationships and uh, we sort of, we've worked our way through very gradually through the entire play. And I'm, we're just about to start again from the beginning. And I'm sure now we'll start adding more color, more layers. And it's a slightly different process than I imagine that they went through with the Dutch production, because more was being devised then. So we're interpreting and changing and re re reassessing things now, I guess, with Evo. So it's that, it's that kind of process at the moment. Yeah. OK, Amari, mm -hmm. you play the painter, mm -hmm. JB. A question here. If you could say one thing to your character at the beginning of the story, what would it be? Probably a lot of what these guys are saying to him, calm down. <laughs> um, I guess without giving too much away, but I think as four friends who've essentially grown up together, you know, they went to college together. Um, you sort of see them at the beginning of, the at their, of their 30s, at the beginning of the play. So. Um, JB sort of holds a lot of ambition um, and, and that leads him to success but then I guess with that also comes difficulty so um, yeah I'd be pre prepare yourself for the tough stuff because that's what he has to endure well and so does everyone. <laughs> that's good. Elliot as you say you play the three you know more difficult characters in the book shall we say. Um, Brother Luke, Dr Trailer and Caleb. Do you do you have a favourite quote from A Little Life or a favourite, I'll let you have a bit more than that, a, a favourite passage perhaps or a favourite idea? I was always struck by how, how, how the, the, the book can take you from the darkest points of um, Jude's relationship and his childhood and I would be suddenly with Jude in those uh, scenes and those moments and then was but within that still was some beautiful descriptive um, but simple and accessible imagery of the greenhouse and there's I can't remember the line as such but I almost could hear the closing of the door behind Jude's back and brother Lou, Luke's sort of leadership through that door uh, and it being a sort of point of no return for that character. And there's something so tranquil and beautiful about the images and the um, references in the, those moments of his childhood and the refuge he finds with Brother Luke and the simple tasks that they, they um, spend doing in a difficult early part of Jude's uh, childhood. It's a simple image, and it's typical of Hanya's use of imagery language that kind of like is a sucker punch from nowhere but with no high drama or melodrama and um and that sits with me and we've we've recently encountered that part of the play again and i'm sort of or that that version of it in the play 
and I think it holds as much weight in our moment as it does in the original novel. So. And I'd love to know, as cast members, what is it like having the writer here? I mean, do you find yourselves asking questions? It's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. It's brilliant. Give me a sense. <laughs> Tony was being very modest earlier with saying that she's not really involved, because she is. She's b both involved in the script, but also has met every one of us multiple occasions and I don't know for me personally it's been invaluable I mean when I said to Eva because usually with you work with the director and one of the first questions is but wait right at the beginning of the process any references films books movies anything you know you want to like, guide me to which might help and Eva just said the book <laughs> it's all in the book and and it's true and then of course having Hania here to expand on that I mean we, we met in New York we met on zoom and then we met in New York and it was just I mean, it was we sp spent two hours I had to tear myself away to go and visit Liston on Street because I was just there for a morning. But it was so, so useful and um, valuable. And she is incredibly generous, not just in terms of giving us this book to then make our own, but also in terms of giving us enough uh, guidance and um, uh, steering without ever being kind of prescriptive. You know, and you've got, you've got the fountainhead right there, as it were. Yeah. You know, but also, I remember when, when we met, what I, find, what I found fascinating about our chat was that Hanya was so harsh on her characters. But we, when we talked about Harold, what, what she wanted to tell me about were his flaws. Even though essentially when you read that character, you think to yourself, this is a loving, compassionate human being who tries to support, who tries to bring love into people's lives. And, he, and that's absolutely true. But Hanya was like, he should have gone further. He should have tried harder. Which is wonderful because you're talking about that's an in-depth in thing about characters and flaws that makes them much more human. Because you always go in kind of wanting to like your character and then to have it reassessed for you is extraordinary. He's virtually told me I was, and he's a bad doctor because he's not, <laughs> not doing well. Yeah, well, we did have this conversation and I think it, it really speaks to the actor's intelligence and how, and how deeply they thought about these roles. I mean, and I think for Willem too, who's often thought of as saint-like, um, you know, Luke and I talked about how Willem's great flaw is that he pretends constantly, that he mm. pretends that things are going to be okay, that he pretends that Jude is not as damaged as he is. You know, if you're having sex with someone, you can tell if they're not enjoying it. Mm. And, 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 you know, and Willem chooses to overlook it. Mm. And I think there's a lot of characters who suffer from a fundamental lack of imagination. You know, I mean, I think Jude's one of them, and you know, and and so is 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 Willem. And I was um, saying to Zach, the one character who always sees Jude exactly as he is is Malcolm, and Jude hates him for it. That he resents him for it. That you know, when when you look at the interventions that Malcolm makes in Jude's home to try to prepare for a future that Jude won't want to face, Jude, you know, Jude feels too seen by him, exposed by him. Mm -hmm. And, and becomes wary of him. But you know, all, all of us need someone in our lives who sees us that clearly. God, you're getting the most fantastic insights from the, from, from the person who wrote it. It's amazing. I want to bring you in, Natalie. Yeah. Look, you are the only woman in the cast, clearly. But I know when I spoke to you, Hanya, back in 2015, you, you said you'd originally conceived the novel with no women in it at all. And you thought that was too artificial, is, does my memory serve me yeah. correctly? Yeah, so you, fortunately for you, you <laughs> there is one woman in it. I mean, what is it like though, does, being not the only woman in the cast, but the only woman in the story? It's interesting, one of the things Hanya said to me when we met was that she poses no threat to Jude. She's mm. the only character that poses no threat to him. She is consequently of no interest to him. I think is what you said. Well, I think he's more attracted to people who could damage him. And yeah. you know, and the the inno innovation of Anna in this was I think one of Evo's most brilliant because he takes a character who appears relatively briefly in the book yeah. um, but who and and makes her and actualizes her into this character on stage who's not quite benevolent but is benign and is there sometimes as Jude's conscious sometimes as his witness, sometimes as someone who is scolding him, and she plays a very complex role in his subconscious. And, and Natalie, I think, it brings this really, you know, motherly energy to Jude, and, you know, it's a, it's a play without mothers. She can be 
an irritant to him, quite antagonistic. She can be like a fly, sort of buzzing in his ear, and he has a tendency to want to swat her away. Um, but ultimately, she challenges him, and I think that's a testament to the way the character has been fleshed out in the play. Well, there's a wonderful moment where the line, I was thinking about my answer to your question, Amari, which is, what line would you tell your character at the beginning of the play? And for Jude, it's, it's a line Anna says, which is, if you allow it, the rest of your life will be blessed, and you will meet good people, but you have to make that choice. And she is the one person who intervenes at the right moment, and essentially gives him a chance. And so the whole story is basically uh, premeditated or um, allowed for through her. You're never quite sure, does she actually exist? And you know, she is part of Jude's subconscious, but very real. There's the ghosts of, you know, of, of the various um, people who abused him. And there's the ghosts of the life he could have had, mm -hmm. the choices he could have made. You know, Anna says to him all the time, you have to learn how to speak. If you really want to be close to someone, you have to learn how to tell your story, and he cannot do it. And so this idea of the life he could have had, the person he could have been, if he was able to articulate what had happened to him hangs over the entire play, I think. I mean, it's about a difficult life, and it's someone who, um, who has had, you know, so much taken from him, and the things that he retains are the ability to love and be loved, and you can lose almost everything else in life, but if you hold on to those two qualities, you will have joy in your life. Yeah. Uh, but some people don't get to keep those, and, and Jude's very lucky that those two things weren't stripped from him. Okay, Zach, you play the architect, Malcolm. Are there any specific details that perhaps you've brought to the character that perhaps weren't in the book? The book is written too well. <laughs> Good um, answer. <laughs> I, well, I think, you know, it, it's incredibly descriptive um, who Malcolm is, and, or at least who he wants to be. You know, he has a, a massive struggle with his identity. Um, and perhaps the reason why he's friends with the friends he is, is, is that he's searching for himself amongst them or searching for the parts of himself that he sees in them that he really wants to attain. Um, but I think, you know, we're still in the rehearsal process, so there's, there's room for all of that, for sure. I think it's really fascinating as well that, like, I mean, I hadn't read the book until I'd read the play, so the book became an immediate reference. So I sort of, you know, was coming at the book totally blind, sort of. But be because there is such incredible description, it's amazing that there is all of that content and yet it offers even more springboards to think about lots of other things. It's like, it doesn't feel, um, it doesn't feel finite. Like it feels like that you're still looking for more things. There's always so many things to think about. It kind of feels, In rehearsal, it feels endless. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, there's, there's one great description of Malcolm in the book of him having incredibly long arms. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, there's something to think about, you know, like, you, you, oh, you get to a, a, a place in a rehearsal when you're really enjoying the work that you're doing or really, like, trusting each other to do what, what the text allows you to do, but also, like, what feels right, and, um, and every now and again, you know, you have a thought that goes, remember those long arms, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think I, well, I think we're all still finding things, but ticks or any any specific things, I, I guess, yeah, it's all a process of elimination. Yeah, and I must ask, had anybody read the book before they were cast in the play? Yes, you had. Yeah, 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 back in 2015. The the first hundred pages, I really remember, just because I was so surprised by how insidiously it had acted on me suddenly after about 100 pages i was like oh god i really they feel really real suddenly and it's in the matter of like just a few chapters and suddenly you're like they've sunk into you a little bit yeah it's like they're real people yeah. and, and then when you finish and you're out and that's what everyone says is like why does it have to end yeah i want to stay with them oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Them but i really remember that from from mm. those little the, the, just a few chapters at the beginning and then obviously you know as i went on like, then what happens happens but that's what I really remember. I remember as well almost feeling trapped in the novel. Like I couldn't, I didn't want to put it down and I almost couldn't, I, I couldn't escape even when I did stop reading because yeah. I was still thinking about these characters. That's right, yeah. Well, then there's something about it that's unignorable. I think one of the things that, Hanya, you said on the first day, actually, which I really remember, is that you wanted to write something hot 
as in mm -hmm. emotionally hot, and like it's just sort of like that you can't be indifferent to, and and you know that they you know that you'd got grown a bit tired of books that were clever and like smart, but and witty, but actually this is just like it just hit, it just hits you, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and and then it just. It's just it just lodges itself in your brain, I think, in a way. That, and again, and then it's sort of compulsive reading, and then suddenly you've finished it. You know. One person wanted to know who's asked a question: How are you two working on developing the relationship, which is so central to the book? So the sh sh short answer is I don't really know. As in, like, I think it just it just happens. And actually, it's interesting with this particular process because, as we said earlier, we're stepping into a shape that already exists. So we're not doing lots of discussing. We're not doing lots of, you know, we just jump in, switch our brains off and jump in, really. But fundamentally, I've really enjoyed the fact that we don't, we haven't really talked about it. You know, mm -hmm. like we're just sort of, by virtue of, I mean, I think like lines and runs generally like work as sort of like um, spells. Or, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you just, the more you repeat, the more you do them, just stuff happens. And you're not really aware of what's going on and what's being rearranged in your brain and in your... And, yeah. Part or whatever, and then Absolutely. you just end up and with a relationship. You, yeah, suddenly. you do, and it's like a rumple stilt skin. You know, if you give it a name, it kind of loses its power almost. Mm -hmm. You just, yeah. for a while, you're trying to work out what the hell to do with your arms and legs and speaking at yeah. the same time. It's like, yeah. especially if you've got long arms. arms. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't ever have said that. <laughs> Yes, um, it's, um, it's a, it's a, I was going to say, it's, um, the mad thing about our job is that you, you have to, if you're going to do the work well and, and to, to its sort of biggest potential, you do have to allow yourself to be entirely open on that first day and allow yourself to fall in some kind of love or whatever, you know, you, you sort of, on one level we're replicating Jude and Willem and trying and, and, and harnessing your incredible book, but on the other hand, we're just trying very quickly from the moment we meet on that first day and have coffee, because we didn't know each other before, to be as open as possible with each other. And I just, yeah, hope that he likes me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that we can take this within a controlled environment, because this is a workspace, but we take it to its, you know, most intense and intimate space, both on stage and off, you know. One of the things I've learned from this process so far is how little we might need to discuss things, mm. actually, and actually how, if you're sort of half in, half out as an actor, it's, it's a bit of a difficult dance, but actually if you've, if you've got someone like Eva at the helm, and you know that if he tells you to do something, you should probably do it, because it's probably the best idea, yeah. um, then, then that means you, 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 you can just do the best thing to do as an actor, I think, which is to switch your brain off, and just jump in. And it, and it makes it more intimate because it's private. It's between each person. You know, right. Evo, he, it is a quite a specific uh, process. Most, most theatre directors like to start with what's called table work, where you sit around a table, endless cups of coffee and cakes, and you just talk. And you build the sort of emotional, private, quiet, internal journey of these characters, and then you put it on its feet. So the colour comes before the infrastructure. Right. He, he likes to sort of build the climbing frame and then later on say, go and play. And right. so, so every, and actually you don't really get to sort of do any of the discussion with him about any of the internal journey. So what you do discover is very private. And, and in line with what you said, it's, it's a very quiet, intimate dance, whatever it is. It's, yeah, it's very cool. We're gonna come in tomorrow, we're gonna to be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's been tense, wasn't it? <laughs> 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 the night <after. laughs> But talking about intimacy in the audience, there will be members of the audience sitting actually on the stage. I mean, Elliot, if I ask you first of all, how does that affect your performance as an actor? Are you much more conscious if you've got, got people behind you, for say? No, I mean, there will be a responsibility to um, every member of the audience, wherever they're sat, to deliver this, uh, a sort of... Um, an equal and democratic distribution of the story. We have people, we're sort of in a traverse or promenade, aren't we? With people behind us and in front of us. And I think there are opportunities to um, work that as an actor. You've got an eye on somebody there or over your shoulder. You're gonna be excited from the minute you come in and smell the space and hear it and see it. You couldn't do it in any other medium. This is pure theater. And I'm gonna say the stage seating is really a, a, a great externalization of what it means to be a reader of this book. You know, I mean, sometimes the reader is a voyeur and sometimes the reader is a witness and sometimes the reader is the only company Jude has. It's sometimes very claustrophobic and the actors never, I mean, 
James will never be off stage. It, it's almost like they're in a terrarium, something that's constantly living and changing and growing and decaying at the same time. And it really has that effect. It's very live, you know, yeah. things are being cooked and there's smells and they are very up close and personal, those people on stage, they're on stage and we will be aware of them. We can't not be aware of them be, because we will see them, you know, in their There's a reality to it as mm. well as a theatricality to it. I think you could look at it and think that is real, happening in front of us, hopefully in, in the way we look and behave with each other, but also some of the physical effects, but also there's something completely unreal and dreamlike about it. So There's always something happening on stage, but maybe in s some of the slightly calmer moments or, or some of the moments where there's more time that's being allowed for those things to happen, they're you know, there are audience members beyond and out in the proscenium that are looking at audience members watching what's going on. So that's a whole <laughs> other element of being able to see the action through someone else seeing the action. And, and I, you know, I wonder what that, that does. Because it's, it's twofold. It's the people that are in the audience on stage watching what's going on, seeing it being reflected in other people's faces and then vice versa and, and watching them how they respond yeah you know, if yeah and therefore sort of asking whatever, yeah. sort of asking the question therefore of saying you know are you comfortable being a witness yeah. to yeah. this yeah. are you going to do anything about it yeah. are you going to step up and right, stop this right. and try it you know so somebody would like to know this is for the boys um james amari luke and zach what song would you assign to your character uh, well, I mean, Jude sings twice <coughs> in the play. It's a gift. It's a, a leader a ma a ma written by Marla. Um, is, is it... Um, is it even help me here? Is it Kirk Kirkunt? Kirkunt? Rukert leader. Rukert leader. From Rukert Number Rukert leader. Number three, the third Rukert leader. And, it's, um, and he sings it as a gift to Harold, um, uh, which in the book, it's a beautiful scene. He records it on a, a disc and hides it in the, the books, and then Harold and Julia find it much later on. In our production, um, I am actually going to sing it um, to Harold. Very beautifully. I mean, he's very sweet. <coughs> supportive father, isn't he? He's very supportive father, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a very beautiful song, and we discuss what it means and how it has different interpretations, and for Jude it means something um, quite specific about um, escape and um, sanctuary uh, and sort of dis leaving the world, but not as an escape, more as a discovery, hiding and kind of protecting himself. So is there some staggering music in the show, mm. like staggering music choice this that I didn't know about. You know, if you don't know it's going to happen and you'll give, you know, you're doing a moment and then suddenly this music swells out of nowhere and you don't know when it's going to come. And there are a couple of moments like that where there, there are tracks that I, I sort of think, whoa, this is amazing. Kind of film yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. What about you guys? Have you got a song for your characters? I mean, one thing that I tend to do when I'm sort of trying to build something is I sort of listen to music not to decide whether it's kind of that's the music that the person likes but just to just to just as an extra sense of just something to sort of find yourself in a world um I found myself listening to a lot of Kendrick Lamar recently who's not mm. someone that I listen to but just for the world of like what I'm exploring uh I've just found myself like in that avenue and lots of other things too um but yeah may maybe him However, I'm not going to rap, so... <laughs> <laughs> you, you got in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've just heard that the play is going to be extended for another five weeks. Amazing news. How, how excited are you? Very excited. I think it's an, it's an amazing privilege to be in something that is going to, to continue. Yeah. That people well, really want to see. The, the yeah. show sold out so quickly. and There were yeah. so many people, you know, been inundated with... It, so. With ticket requests it feels and whatever, pretty and unprecedented going. considering where the whole industry was a couple of years mm. ago and that yeah, we're right. sort of here right. and it's just been a sellout straight away which is crazy yeah, but cool. yeah it's scary though it's scary but well, in a good way exactly full circle scary back to that really first question yeah. it's we feel this immense responsibility with this incredible book and um but it's a wonderful wonderful responsibility to carry mm. yeah. and a privilege yeah. a privilege yeah well, look, thank you to everyone who sent us questions. Thank you to the cast and company of A Little Life. And most of all, thank you for joining us. From all of us, bye-bye.